Hello, this is Q&A show and I'm really glad to present here of the editor um, of The Republic magazine, actually not only that, uh, but a writer, critic, philosopher and editor, um, all that just in one person, Leon um, Wieseltier. I'm really happy to meet you today and it's a great honor to have you. So I would like to divide our talk in just two parts. So first one would be the media and the media coverage of that questions that we have on Ukraine and the situation in our region in general. And the second one is the identity. So there's clearly that some media and some journalists in Western world does uh, represent the Russian point of view on the situation in our region and in the country in general. What would you say it is and how would you describe this distribution of uh, pro-Ukrainian, let's say, and pro-Russian uh, situation? If, would you say that journalists are really uh, describing the situation as it is, as you see, um, and is the influence of this Russian uh, media are so big in Western world? I think, first of all, most Americans do not know or understand a great deal about what's happening here. That's the first thing to say, um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, secondly, I think it's clear to most Americans that Putin is a thug and a bully and that he has been doing things, act, committing acts of aggression against another country um, and that in doing so he's violating many norms of international law uh, and I don't, I think that, that most Americans understand that. I don't see in the American media any positive representations of Putin. The question is whether the American people and whether the American government will draw certain conclusions about what they understand here that would require the United States to act in some more forceful way against Putin because of what he's been doing in Ukraine and to Ukraine. And that's a complicated question. And if if, if, if the president, well, the president doesn't want to be very forceful, which is a disgrace in my view, and if the American people are not inclined or not in the mood for a forceful American response, it isn't because Russia has succeeded in persuading the American people with its lies that Putin is not the villain in this story. That's not the problem. That's not the problem. I mean, the American media reports on Putin's propaganda machine. The American media, people who read the American media understand that Putin has now created a vast machinery of lies. Um, but no, in the States, people are not falling for the lies. Nobody thinks that, that Ukraine is wrong in this conflict with Russia. At least nobody significant that I know about. There are people who worry that the United States may be involved in another Cold War. There are people like myself who then respond that if we will be involved in another Cold War, it's because Putin is actually inaugurating something like that. It won't be the same, but something like that. But no, I wouldn't. The basic outlines of the story, the true, the, the, the basic facts, I think, are pretty clear. And so what would you say are the biggest concerns of uh, Western media in questions of uh, Ukraine that can threaten really the image of Ukraine, a country that struggled so much and went so much in its way basically to its independence and the democracy and the rule of law? What are those major concerns? Well, I think that there there are two parts to the problem. The first part is what's happening in Ukraine. The second part is what's happening in Russia. I think that, as I say, what's happening in Ukraine, I think is pretty clear in the American media, which is that Ukraine prefers to associate itself with the West, with Europe, and that Ukraine prefers to be a democratic, pluralistic country. And this, this provoked Putin because he felt threatened and challenged by this Ukrainian preference and he responded with all sorts of acts of aggression uh, by stealing territory, by claiming territory, by destabilizing regions in the Ukraine and so on. And I think all that is clear. There's also the question of what is happening in Russia. I mean, the, Putin, the, the crisis in the Ukraine, Putin's aggression against Ukraine 
has had an effect upon Putin's regime in Russia too. Putin used to be just a, a sort of cynical, kleptocratic, corrupt authoritarian. He now is trying to emerge as the hero of a certain sort of radical Russian nationalism, which represents intolerance to minorities, for example, all this nonsense about how all Russian speakers should live with all other Russian speakers. I mean, that's an attack on the pluralist idea of society. That's an attack on a dem democratic model of living. And I think people are aware that the situation in Moscow and in, in Russia is getting worse for Russians. It's getting worse for Russians. Um, so, and I, as I say, both of these, these narratives, I think, are pretty clear. Um, the question is what conclusions are Americans, ordinary Americans, and what conclusions are Americans in government drawing from these narratives. How would you describe the image of Putin and some people who represent the politics of Russia on international level, let's say Lavrov, how Western media... It, it's generally agreed, as I said, that Putin is a thug, that he is, um, that he's deeply resentful of the position of Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that he has enormous historical grudges, that he's a former KGB man who only understands power in its coarsest form, um, that he would like, th that he resents American dominance uh, in various places in the world. I mean, all this, I, I mean, the image of Putin is not a flattering one. Uh, Lavrov is a little more complicated, partly because people don't follow it at that level, but also Lavrov is an extremely smart man. It's clear that he's a very skillful, he's very skillful at the diplomatic tricks, is the word I would use, at the diplomatic tricks that Russia is, is using, not just about Ukraine, but also about Syria and Iran and all this running to Geneva for meaningless things, for completely meaningless things. One of my criticisms of my own government is that every time Lavrov says the word Geneva, everybody packs their bags and goes to Geneva when there's nothing to do in Geneva because you don't go to Geneva until you have a strong position and you know what you want and you go and you make demands. But every time Lavrov says Geneva, Kerry meets him in Geneva. And I think that's foolish. Lavrov is playing a very smart game. Putin, I'm not sure, is playing a very smart game. He's playing a very rough game. And it's actually not a game. It's very, very serious. So how would you say Geneva, it wasn't any sense in going there for, let's say, Americans, your own government, and would you say that it would make any sense going there and discussing this, trying to make it really in a diplomatic way, because neither of us obviously wants a war. So would you say there is any sense really in further discussions in Geneva? Zero. Zero. I mean, the, it was outrageous that we met Lavrov in Geneva to discuss Ukraine. Outrageous. And of course, the deal fell apart before the ink was dry. I mean, it was nonsense. It was complete rubbish. It didn't affect the thing, but it made the, the American government feel like it was pursuing a diplomatic solution. When it was pursuing an illusion, there was no solution to be pursued diplomatically because Putin is not finished yet. I mean, it's quite clear that he's not finished. I don't, we don't know what he's going to do. But he's not finished yet. I mean, you know, he says he's moving his troops back. He's not moving any troops back. He lies. So, but our, the need, and it's not so much Kerry, it's Obama, it's my president. Um, you know, he's so, he, it's hard for him to, he doesn't want war, obviously. Nobody wants war. He doesn't like military solutions. And I think it's probably safe to say that there won't be a military solution to what happens here. But for that reason, he pursues diplomatic solutions sometimes before we're ready to pursue the diplomatic solution. I mean, if you want a negotiation, that's fine, but you have to go from a strong position, a really strong position, you have to have your demands, you have to be ready to walk away. You have, I mean, you don't just go to Geneva because uh, for, for peace, love, and understanding, you see. So, I mean, now these are my views, but I think that, I mean, it's pretty clear to everybody that in the case of Ukraine, in the case of Syria, maybe in the case of Iran, it's a little bit ambiguous, that Geneva has been, it's been a series of failures. I mean, I, I recently wrote that Geneva is the world capital of failure right now. That if you want to fail, go to Geneva. That's what Geneva produces, is failures. 
Um, I think that's pretty clear. So you say that you are expecting a strong position from your government and that would be something that you would be happy to see. Uh, but what would you say are actually your expectations of the uh, U.S. government in Ukraine and towards the situation in Ukraine? But basically we can say that it's not only a problem of Ukraine anymore, it's a problem of the whole region. I don't have many high expectations of my government right now. I wish that the president... I wish that President Obama pursued generally a stronger foreign policy. I wish that he, I wish that dictators around the world and people who commit atrocities around the world were more afraid of Obama than they are. I wish that the United States offered more obstacles to dictators and to people who commit atrocities than we do now. Um, you know, Obama has pulled the United States back from the world a little. The big symbol, his biggest achievements in his view are withdrawing from Iraq and withdrawing from Afghanistan. Now whatever you think about that, let's say we should withdraw from Iraq and we should withdraw, whatever you, whatever, the fact is there's the rest of the world and history doesn't stop. I mean Putin, if Putin's calculation has been quite clearly that he can proceed with his nefarious plans about Ukraine because the United States will offer no significant resistance. And he was right. And he was right. Um, and if you look at the European countries, I mean, the terrible irony here is that Ukraine rightly wants to affiliate with Europe. But Europe is so concerned about the economic consequences to itself of sanctioning Russia that you here in Ukraine cannot rely upon the countries with whom you want to join right now. It's a, there are all sorts of ironies and paradoxes here. So there, in my view, there isn't sufficiently strong Western resistance to Putin, just as I think there isn't to Assad, I think there isn't to the Iranian regime. I mean, I have my own, we're not talking about that. But um, I have to say that, you know, when I come here, I always feel bad, I wish I could say, um, I wish I could lift everybody's spirits and say, get ready, the Americans are coming. But they're not. But they're not. And, um, and you can see that. I mean, if Putin continues, if he commits other outrages, there will be some American and Western responses. They will be economic. They will be as, as small and as narrow as possible. The Europeans, you know, everyone says that because of globalization, we can sanction Putin economically. But the problem with that is that because of globalization, when we sanction him economically, the Europeans complain because they're the people who get the gas and the oil and to whom the Russian oligarchs bring their money. And so it's all very complicated. And now something um, about your book, Against the Identity, as I said, an amazing book uh, which describes actually what are the biggest challenges in modern notions of the identity and how uh, there is a certain, we can say, ignoring of the complexity and um, really the individual identity, um, individuals' multiple identities. What would you say is the biggest threat now in Ukraine? Because we can see that that's Putin's politics really for a clash uh, of Ukrainian different multiple identities and that we can see that there was never a conflict really and now we can see that okay this is one of the biggest problems that we can really face right now. One of the reasons the Ukrainian revolution is so exciting to people like me is because it is choosing a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilinguistic model of the state over the traditional nationalist nation-state model according to which every state should basically represent one nation so that the political boundaries and the cultural boundaries should basically coincide. Now since they never coincide, all such states have this problem of minorities and we know that they sometimes don't solve this problem in very admirable ways. The only solution really historically to the problem of minorities is to abandon the idea of, a, of an ethnically or religiously or culturally or linguistically uniform state and adopt a model of a pluralistic state in which people who speak different languages and practice different religions and have different ethnic backgrounds and inherit different traditions can live together, in this case as Ukrainians. For me that's one of the reasons that, the, but, but it, that it's, what's happening here is so exciting. Um, and, and that's something that Putin fears 
That's something that he fears. Now, it is, of course, historically idiotic for him to oppose this because Russia itself is a vast multi-ethnic, multilinguist. I mean, so the, the contradictions in Putin's thinking are another matter. That's another matter, but, you know, contradictions and illogic never stop people from acting. But the, the, the Ukrainian model, the, the, what the people here are, 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 are championing, this idea of a genuinely pluralistic Ukraine, I think is admirable. It's very much what we Americans um, have and support. It's, it's our way of life. Europe, it's a little different. Europe and multi-ethnicity, it's not a happy story. It's not a happy story. Europe is the old model. They have the problem of minorities, and it's a very, and terrible things can happen in that situation. But America, and to a certain extent India, but that's more complicated, are really multi-ethnic, multicultural democracies. And that's what, that's what the Ukrainians seem to be desiring for themselves. And I think they're right, and I think it's something that Americans certainly have to support. It's what we stand for, too. In your words, and I would like to cite now this from uh, your book, Against Identity, only one in possession of an identity would understand why one would wish to get rid of it. And usually politicians um, find an identity crisis as a problem, and for them that's one of the biggest concerns. What would you say is the problem now of the identity in Ukraine and in Europe in general? Um, there's a certain kind of national identity, which was the classical European sort of national one, that required you for full membership in the nation to erase or to subtract aspects of your own particular identity. Um, the most dramatic example of this in European history would be Jewish, the Jewish case, especially in the period of emancipation in the late 18th, 19th, 19th centuries. But there, so that's a certain model. You can be a citoyen, a French citizen, but then you have to come as a Frenchman. You can't come as a Jew or as a Muslim, right? Then there is the other model, which is you can be an American or let's say a Ukrainian, and you can speak as a Ukrainian at the same time as you speak as a Jew or a Muslim. At the same time. All you do is you put a little hyphen, a little dash, and so you don't subtract, you add. You add, but the addition of your traditional inherited identity doesn't take anything away from your national identity in a pluralist situation. So that you can, as I say, you can be a Ukrainian and a Jew, or a Ukrainian and a Muslim, or a Ukrainian and a Christian, or a Ukrainian and a Russian speaker, or whatever. And there's no, con in that, that, that conception of, for that conception of identity, there's no contradiction. The problem is that dictators have enormous use for the politics of identity. They always have. Because it's all, whenever there's political chaos or economic chaos or national weakness, or it's always, there's a certain kind of demagoguery, a certain kind of dictatorship, basically it's known as fascism, uh, in which you can appeal to the ethnic unity of a population against a foreigner or against a stranger. Right? And, and this works all the time. This works all the time. Um, it worked in Europe in, in the 20th century, as we know. Um, today, just this morning, we'll see what happens. But in India, the radical Hindu party has just been elected in a landslide, in a landslide. And some very unpleasant things could happen there in Hindu-Muslim relations, in a landslide. Um, and Putin is playing this card now, too. Putin is now trying to strengthen his regime and provide it with a justification, with legitimacy, because in fact he didn't have he didn't really have legitimacy. I mean he won elections, but he was a he was a corrupt autocrat. Now he's the savior of Russia. Now he so he is playing, he's acting in the traditional manner of dictators who want to solve their internal problems of their own, their own political problems by appealing to, to identity, to identity as the basis for nationalism. And national identity, as I say, can, should not be regarded monolithically. It should not be regarded monolithically. But this is hard. But this is hard. So we can see that clearly now that Russia wants to build its own kind of an identity and we can say that for the moment it's really strong, much stronger than uh, the Western identity that we can say because in Europe we have this 
Germans, French people, Spanish, Italian, whoever. And we have the same situation in America where we got this huge mix of all the possible identities. But we can see now that Russia is trying to build that image that Russia stands against really all the Western world. How would you describe the situation with this really a clash of the identities right now? If you look at some of the problems that some of the Western European states are confronting with their Muslim minorities, for example, you do see that they are, some people um, are returning, are falling back on an old chauvinistic conception that to be a European or to be a Frenchman or to be a German is to be, let's say, a Christian, right? One of the reasons that they don't want Turkey into the EU is because they still remember the Battle of Vienna in 1783. Right? The Turk. The Turk is coming to destroy Christian Europe, the infidel. Right? And so in Europe they do have these traditions in which they appeal to a monolithic, ancient, exclusive ethnic or religious identity. Now, since they're also democratic countries, there are debates about this and you also have multiculturalism in, in some of these countries. In America, so we don't have this problem because in, we are a nation of immigrants. If you're a nation of immigrants, it's very hard to accuse somebody else of being a foreigner. Because except for the Native Americans, everybody's a foreigner. And if everybody's a foreigner, there is no native, and there's nobody who could say, the people coming off that boat are stealing my country. The challenge then becomes, first for everybody to tolerate everybody else's belief, but also for believers themselves, they have to learn to restrain themselves a little bit. When they get out into the public square, I mean, there's freedom of religion. They have churches and synagogues and mosques. In the churches and the synagogues and mosques, they can do what they want. I mean, if they don't break the law, but they can do what they want. But in the public square, it's a challenge to believers. You have to restrain yourself a little bit. You can't walk around like it all belongs just to you. And sometimes people find that frustrating. Sometimes people, especially when people are in the majority and everyone around them looks to them like themselves, sometimes they forget that not everybody is like themselves. And, so, and it, 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 you have to acquire democratic psychological habits is what they are. And sometimes it's not that easy. So we have Leon Wiesel here now as a guest and I'm really happy and delightful to have such an honorable, really honorable guest, a philosopher, um, editor, writer, and hopefully we will try to make another interview with him.